Is anyone listening to this podcast? Maybe Disney would like, like, call me, <laughs> someone. I got a lot of ideas. <laughs> no way to execute. <laughs> and that's how we got into directing Disney movies. Welcome to Why Is This Good, a podcast by the Naples Writers Workshop. I'm Christine, and I'm here with John. Hey, John. Hello. Okay, it's my turn, and I found my story the way I find most of my stories, which is by Googling best (laughs) short stories, and then if I get really desperate, free online. I suggest these search terms for everyone. (laughs) We've done so many from those lists now. (laughs) I mean, when I was going through it, I sent you those screenshots because for the first time in a while, (laughs) I was able to like check several of them off, you you know, usually I, yeah. I come up with these lists and I'm, if I haven't read them, it's because they're so old. I'm just like, I don't want to read that. Like, no, I don't. <laughs> yeah. One wasn't written. No, I, I already hate it. <laughs> but then I, I started looking. And I was like, wow, John's really made me read a lot of this shit. And some of them were ones that I had actually come across myself. But this is one that I hadn't even seen. Usually they're, they're very repetitive lists too. You know, like the lottery is on every single list. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Literally every single Thimbles list. and signs in the book. Yes. Off. Yeah. And there's just, you know, you just kind of glaze over. And this was a title that I hadn't heard, but it was interesting because it had won all these awards. I'm like, I must have been glossing over this for a while. So it's called Paper Menagerie by Ken Liu. And this is like a reprint of the story well after it had won what they described as all three of the major sci-fi awards. So the Hugo, the Nebula and the World Fantasy Award. I was like, wow. And I haven't come across it. I'm bad at Googling. (laughs) So there's a little section that I was going to read here. Mark, one of the neighborhood boys, came over with his Star Wars action figures. Obi-Wan Kenobi's lightsaber lit up and he could swing his arms and say in a tinny voice, Use the Force. I didn't think the figure looked much like a real Obi-Wan at all. Together we watched him repeat this performance five times on the coffee table. Can he do anything else, I asked. Mark was annoyed by my question. Look at all the details, he said. I looked at the details. I wasn't sure what I was supposed to say. Mark was disappointed by my response. Show me your toys. I didn't have any toys except my paper menagerie. I brought out Lao Hu from my bedroom. By then, he was very worn, patched all over with tape and glue, evidence of the years of repairs mom and I had done on him. He was no longer as nimble and sure-footed as before. I sat him down on the coffee table. I could hear the skittering steps of the other animals behind in the hallway, timidly peeking into the living room. Xiao, Lao Hu, I said, and stopped. I switched to English. This is Tiger. Cautiously, Lao Hu strode up and purred at Mark, sniffing his hands. Mark examined the Christmas wrap pattern of Lao Hu's skin. That doesn't look like a tiger at all. Your mom makes toys for you from trash? I'd never thought of Lao Hu as trash, but looking at him now, he was really just a piece of wrapping paper. Mark pushed Obi-Wan's head again. The lightsaber flashed. He moved his arms up and down. Use the force. Lao Hu turned and pounced, knocking the plastic figure off the table. It hit the floor and broke, and Obi-Wan's head rolled under the couch. Rawr! Lao Hu laughed. I joined him. Mark punched me. Hard. This was very expensive. You can't even find it in stores now. It probably cost more than what your dad paid for your mom. I stumbled and fell to the floor. Lao Hu growled and leapt at Mark's face. Mark screamed, more out of fear and surprise than pain. Lao Hu was only made of paper after all. Mark grabbed Lao Hu, and his snarl was choked off as Mark crumpled him in his hand and tore him in half. He balled up the two pieces of paper and threw them at me. Here's your stupid cheap Chinese garbage. After Mark left, I spent a long time trying without success to tape together the pieces, smooth out the paper, and follow the creases to refold Lao Hu. Slowly, the other animals came into the living room and gathered around us, me and the torn wrapping paper that used to be Lao Hu. Dude, I read this in public and cried. In public? (laughs) Yes. I had to put my sunglasses on, John. Yeah, this is a pretty affecting story, isn't it? Yeah. Um, had you read this before? I had not encountered this story before. No. There's so many stories out there. It's like I know. It's just like when one has won all of these awards though, and they're like, Yeah, this is like I'm like, what? <laughs> and like I said, it's it now that I see it, it's on these lists. So I didn't I like a lot of these stories, I just like saw it on a list. I skimmed a paragraph. I don't even know if I skimmed a paragraph and I sent it to you. And as soon as I started reading it, I was so excited because I could tell it was the kind of story that I'm personally interested in. It gave a Toy Story. It was giving uh, Indian in the Cupboard. Ah. Yeah, like little magical stories as kids that, I mean, we all kind of like those, but I just remember being like so hopeful that like, especially the Indian in the Cupboard stuff. I'm like, I just want these little animal figures to be real. Like Toy Story was really cute and awesome. But like, I think it was like at that point, I wasn't really hopeful that my toys are coming live. But Indian in the Cupboard, I was like, yes, yes. This is how I started writing stories as a kid. Yeah. Is uh, all the stuffed animals and we would play with them and we would tell these intricate stories about space travel and conquest and and romance and like... There 
was romance. There was love. There was there was like there was generations. There was the the grown up ones, the kid ones. The kid ones would go to school and we played school <laughs> with them. The grown up ones would like go on adventures and then they'd have family life and like it was vast and <laughs> all kinds of stories came out of that. And that was my beginning in storytelling. So like yeah, I'm totally on board with all this. Yeah, and I mean when you're that age, what more could you hope for than to have your little toys be real, you know? And like animals in particular, like we were just obsessed with pets. So anyway, I'm I'm reading this and I'm I'm already interested in what they're calling sci-fi, which I think is like an interesting thing because I, I would describe this more as like fantasy. Yeah, this is fantasy. Yeah, so it's one like these sci-fi words, but it's very much like science fiction, fantasy, fantasy. I think the sci-fi awards are usually sci-fi fantasy awards. Not all the time, but a lot yeah. of them. Yeah, so fantasy in the sense that, you know, this isn't following anything that could actually happen. But basically it's about a, a kid who's father has ordered a bride from China and they have a child and by most accounts in this book they seem to have like a decent marriage for those circumstances like I don't think his dad was I don't know what his motivations were but like you know he took care of his wife and he had a kid and he like loved them both you know and he took care of her until she died and like tried to be good to his son too and you know it's like a story about how the son is like growing up and (laughs) facing a lot of shit a lot of racism and how he decides to deal with it for many years of his life is to kind of like disavow his mother which is heartbreaking but what the theme is throughout is that she made these little origami critters for him that could actually come to life and he loves those animals yeah she called it the practical magic of her village yeah which damn i want to come from that village because this is so cool the dragons that would fly and the little yeah. things that chase the rats and- yeah yeah they like in their village they use these little origami creatures practically right and she makes them as toys but they're as interactive and rich and real as that little snippet that I read you know there's like all these things that they do there's like scenes where they're trying to make uh, sharks out of the wrapping paper and they just drown so they had to make them tin foil. so like but in a sense these creatures are like sentient you know and they do like die so we see the tiger die but we also see him come back to life a couple more times in the story because it's just like her presence and her her magic that makes them real yeah so it's the whole story is so sad because you're dealing with like like these animals that are dying, you know, but there's also this, this like flavor to the whole story that is like grief. It's the, his um detachment, his like rejection of, it. so he is, the scene you read is like the pivotal scene because that's yeah. when his Chinese heritage is like brought against him at school. Right. And right. They, he comes home and he's like, what are they calling me? What is this bad name they're calling me? Yeah. And then she, he starts to hate her because she represents that Chinese heritage. And it isn't until after like the end to give away the end end is until after she dies that he learns what that heritage really meant to her and could mean to him and it's just like this hugely emotional ending this is why you were crying in public right oh yeah i was crying with the animals too because i i kind of knew like what they were hinting at the whole time right yeah it ends with this like horribly emotional letter. Oh yeah. He he doesn't quite reconcile because he she's died and like he can't quite, but he's finally coming to terms, figuring out, understanding like what he was had been rejecting all his life. And um he's grieving for that, having lost it and missed it. Right. And I think what makes this extremely difficult, like in the moment for him, is that his mother has never fully learned English. And so when he decides that he doesn't want to talk to her, he's not ignoring her. She is incapable of communicating with him and he's shutting her out fully because he's the only one in the family that can like translate, right? Yeah. He's the only one who speaks both languages. And now he's rejecting the other one. He's like, no, he's just not going to translate for her either. And so there's like scenes where like his father is kind of like, like I said, I think the dad is like, we're not supposed to think he's a bad guy a good guy he's just kind of like doesn't know how he's supposed to navigate this really but like there's a scene at a, I think at a dinner table and the dad is telling the son like or the dad's telling the mom like what did you expect like we knew this was going to happen eventually we knew this was going to be really really hard for our son that was going to be half Chinese and that we were going to have to deal with it and the dad kind of gives her a little bit of shit for not figuring out how she was going to help assimilate alongside him you know like how she was going to make it easier on him by like you know he says like she started cooking American food and she does start to 
learn a little bit of English. I don't know. And you can't really blame this kid at the, at the age that he's at, right? Where there's a pivotal scene like this. And there's a scene before that where these women come into the house and they speak English and they don't think that he speaks English and they're saying horrible things about him and his mother. Like, sounds like he grew up in a time where everything was going to be against him. And what, how, how else was he supposed to react than to like reject what was most different about him, you know? Yeah. And even as a kid, he like knows that it's wrong to be feeling and doing what he's doing to his mother. Yeah. And I love this encapsulation of like the distinction between the two heritages that he's picking from. His dad tells her, you have to learn to speak English. And then she says, if I say love, I feel it here. She pointed to her lips. If I say I, I feel it here. And she put her hand over her heart. So it's like, she is Chinese. Like she's trying to say, this is who I am. Right. And you were rejecting the thing that I feel in my heart. You know, I can say these, I can learn this other thing, but that is not who I am. Right. And he doesn't recognize that in the moment. Like that's no. something he comes back to later. And that's why he he writes that symbol for I all over the letter when he finally gets it at the end. Right. Uh-huh. I point that out because I like this. Um, it's, it's such a good, like subtle connection between parts of the story right. where she brings it up and she makes that personal connection with the word I, the word love. And then at the end of the story, when he's writing that character over and over again, it's a callback you know, but it has all that emotion wrapped up in it. Right. It's like, okay, I understand why you wanted to use that word. Right. Why you wanted to speak Chinese. Because that's what her whole letter is about. Is like, this is my Chinese heritage. This is my parents, the village we came from, everything that you're rejecting. This is what it all is. Right. So after she dies, the letter that we keep referencing is written on the origami tiger. Inside the tiger. I know. Yeah. Right. And so he finally like comes, he had kept these animals, right? He comes across one of them. And by now he's like with his girlfriend. So he basically like, you know, goes on to like have probably a normal life, but he seems, he seems like one of these guys that we don't know a whole lot about him, like personally, because it is all told like through this lens of his mother and these creatures. But like, that's why I think this whole story has that heavy feeling, right? Because yeah. when he reflects on these key moments in his childhood, he's realizing now that they all have culminated into his biggest regret somehow, which is that he didn't get to know his mother personally. So he has kept these animals though. And, and that's why like, we know that he's like holding on to them. And it's like, if I was holding on to those animals, maybe like they'd only be good memories, right? And for him, it's like this like burden almost. He's like keeping them because he feels guilty. He they They did have magic for him when he was little but he still never appreciated them finally he opens one of them is the point though and they have they have these well, it opened itself did it okay and it's on, on the day the, of the yeah the specific day of remembrance right and like one of the things that she told him on her deathbed was like to think of her on this day that her village would have celebrated like the departed relatives and she's like if you think about me really hard like you know i'll be there type thing and then there's magic in these little paper menagerie because they can communicate with his mother right if he like thinks really hard he can like send messages to her so that's the fantasy part of it right you said before that a lot of the stories kind of, we don't know a lot about them because it's mostly focused on like interactions with these little origami things that reminds me of the like kind of your takeaway or the lesson from that story that how to eat chicken wings was like finding a uh a specific a yeah this is like a bigger version of that instead of just three yeah. things about chicken wings this is like 10 things about these little origami things right. you know and they all make a cohesive like an arc like right. the arc of his life and his relationship with his mother is through the lens of those little vignettes with the origami animals right and so that that's like a focusing thing and that's like kind of the interest like we want to know more about these origami animals but then along the way we're also learning about his relationship with his mother and like his feelings about his heritage yeah so that's like kind of like bleeds into like my takeaway but believe it or not i remember vividly in elementary school and junior high reading tons of stories about like assimilation you know uh, yeah and like the one i remember like off the top of my head right now is like the joy luck club and it's about like first generation chinese americans you know but anyway I, I feel like um when i read a story and i realize that it's like tiptoeing around there i'm not saying i'm filling in all the gaps because i know everything but it's a familiar enough concept that he would reject his mother and feel guilty about it right and that she would have had a private struggle that he doesn't understand so that to me is like maybe a common story you know and as i'm reading it i'm like willing to go that route but i I think like you pointed out the two things 
that make this so unique is that he not only tells it by focusing on something very specific, right? So we've probably read a million stories where they've told this story through food, for example. I can't name one, but that feels familiar. Where he would talk about like, I want to eat pizza, basically, but like, that's not what mom knows how to make. Yeah. You know, <laughs> shit like that. It's it's like, it, and it sounds like a stereotype almost, but I just feel like that's something we're familiar with, whether it's like in fiction or like movies, you know? So, but he's focused it through through a lens um, on this, like on these origami creatures. And then he's taken it to this other level, right? And I don't know anything about him or if the, if any, what, what about this is like accurate for him or, you know, if this is his real mother or if there is a village that believes powerfully in like, you know, these origami creatures having some kind of magic to them, right? Like there could be truth to that. But we as readers in this story, like accept that there's fantasy injected into it, right? And that's to me what feels um, so authentic about it and makes it so real and vivid, right? So I might like think to myself when I remember this story, like, yeah, he was having trouble with his culture and his identity and all that kind of stuff. But I'm also mostly going to remember these little animals and how guilty he felt about like not accepting his mother, even though she did these wonderful things for him with them. You know, the first opening scene is that he used to just sob as a kid. And this is like the one thing that made him stop, you know. But anyway, so my takeaway being that like, you might think that you have a really common story, you know, and you're reluctant to tell it for that reason, because you maybe are one of a million people that have experienced like my mom died I'm going through a breakup right like that's not very common but like I bet if you are as good a writer as Ken Liu right because he's not relying solely on fantasy here but if you're if you're as wonderful a writer as he is and if you do have as rich a story like and you can add this like beautiful element of like I would almost it's like magic to me it's not really fantasy this feels like magic you know it's like magic the way Harry Potter feels like comfy and cozy and like wonderful and like Indian in the cupboard like it's like this warm magic like wouldn't it be amazing if that could happen you know and he's like injected that and that feels like uh you know the the literal magic for the story like i I consider this also like a gateway into fantasy because people who are like i don't like dragons okay fine this is fantasy too though like fantasy is wouldn't it be cool if I don't know. That's kind of my takeaway. Yeah, my takeaway is I was going to be very similar because um, I was thinking about this story in a similar way, but kind of almost backwards is the story is about the son rejecting his mother and then coming to find out that reconnecting with her after her death, more or less. And it's the letter. You know, all of these things could have been ordinary elements. He could have discovered the letter in a different way. There could have been some other conflict that, you know, the paper tiger getting ripped up was just what happened in this story. It could have been something else when he was a child that could have been made fun of for ordinary reasons. There's other ways to reject your heritage that's not reliant on magical circumstances. But I was thinking about fantasy in general. And, you know, because of what I read as a kid, I often think of fantasy as being like secondary world fantasy, where it's all yeah. brand new. It's some other, it's the Lord of the Rings, it's Middle Earth, it's some other planet, it's other worlds. But there are smaller fantasies that are real right. world. There's magic realism where you just bring magic into like realistic situations. Yeah. And um, those are more subtle kind of fantasies and a lot of them can come from cultural touchstones like right. the belief that a certain culture has in some kind of magic and you just bring that onto stage and make it real and so those kinds of little fantasies can spice up or you know they're a little extra layer to what would be another kind of story and in this case it becomes intrinsic to the story right it is about the origami the origami is the the pathway through which the the drama unfolds folds. Right. So I like that as just like an, like you call it an entry into fantasy, you know, like like a gateway drug. It's a great for the, just finding creative ways to tell stories, you know? And a lot of times when I think about writing fantasy, because, you know, like I said, I grew up reading a lot of fantasy. I always thought of myself as a fantasy writer until I was like, mostly when I was young. And then when I got older, I was like, I'm writing literary fiction. <laughs> um, but I always had this fantasy thing in the background, you know, the kind of parallel tracks. But right. you don't have to make a whole new world <laughs> to yeah. write fantasy. You can just incorporate small bits of magic here and there. So I like that. Yeah. And I think what's interesting about this story, too, is that there can be magic happening inside this little boy's house but not next door yeah it's emblematic of the the heritage too because it's like there's no other magic in the world it's like just her magic and that's it and she references that it's a it's her village's magic so you can imagine that there are other versions of this but we don't need to know about them like small small practical magic from some other place you know and like some other little village somewhere has something similar where they do something but we don't need to know about that and even some of the other characters like the other boy his reaction isn't just a astonishment and bewilderment 
it's ah, your stupid Chinese magic. <laughs> yeah. The only thing that I could like think of when I was reading it was how we like we write about witches these days, you know, and they don't wear black hats and capes, but like they can maybe brew a potion every once in a while. You know what I mean? It's like it's kind of casual and it's kind of like cultural and it's like this deep rooted. I don't know. There's something cool about that, too. And I wouldn't describe myself as someone that's seeking out that kind of fiction. But here it felt like something if you were going to hope to copy anything that he's done, it would be to think of, you know, what's a cool thing that could happen and how would you do it like you can just do it you can just have just one little weird aspect of magic in your story (laughs) and maybe that's how you win your hugo right (laughs) yeah i wonder without that like if this story were told without the magic it was some other device was used how the story would have gone through the literary magazines like well i feel like the only thing close like and why i'm calling it magic why i feel like it's magic is kind of it's the closest thing to religion almost you know yeah when he's sending the origami animals he's sending them through magic but really that's like prayer in a lot of you know what i mean yeah there's a little it is similar to that you know it's like the village ritual which can be considered like religious but i'm talking about if you take the magic out and you tell the story as just straight cultural whatever yeah you know like you said before food or something else and it's no longer magic right there's no magic at all in the story it's just like it references maybe her village's religion or something like that and then you submit it to a non-fantasy non sci-fi literary journal how does that go for this story well that's what i mean when i say that i feel like his story is pretty common I, and, and it's, i feel terrible saying that like I, I do think you could read this and still have like a strong emotional response but i don't know what else would make this stick out because we're we're familiar with the, like this 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 is a common plight i feel like so the fantasy element is what yeah. ma- i mean the rest of the story i think the rest of the story is like really affecting it's very powerful yeah, it's it a is. great story yeah but the fantasy element makes it something more more than yes. just a run of the mill kind of heritage story, right? Right. And that's an interesting fact, isn't it? You know, this is like if we want to learn maximally from these stories, like we would spend a lot of time dissecting what is it that it's adding? Like what is the reader experience? What is the emotion? I think it's just like something extremely memorable. Like I wrote at the at the end of this that like I'm surprised this one is not a movie yet. Oh, it could easily be that. You know what I mean? It lends yeah. itself to this, it's like, visually strong. Visual. Yeah. Yeah. And there's something to be said. I imagine that's why a lot of people like reading fantasy and sci-fi, because there has to be the strong visual element to the writing. There's a description of really good fantasy. It goes something like it's a marriage of the familiar and the strange. I forget who to attribute this to, but but you have something familiar, like problems with accepting your heritage or your heritage being rejected by your peers. And so you try to like run from it. And then the strange is this like little magical touch, right? And the strange part, like the familiar is like the anchor kind of like the thing that you recognize in the story story that you kind of like about the story. And the right. strange is the fun new thing that you get to experience in the story. And I think that's kind of what we came to through a back alley through this conversation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Just a little touch. You guys want to just do a little touch of magic? <laughs> Little sprinkles, little sprinkles. Yeah, I think that's what I like about this takeaway too, is that you don't have to suddenly feel as if you've written fantasy. I think some people just like don't want to commit to a genre a lot of times, or if they don't think that they like that, they don't want to call it that. Well, fine, yeah. don't. But like, those are the awards you're going to be up for, right? Because like you said, where else would he be submitting this and would it get lost in the shuffle? Maybe that's the other kind of takeaway is that if you don't think that you like these types of genres, at least uh, force yourself to adapt what they do strongly, which is like the visual aspect of it. Like, yeah. What fantasy story have you read where you're like, I don't know where they are? Well, this is like travel fiction, too. You know, like people, they don't necessarily read about Middle Earth, but they'll read about Paris. They'll read about Milan or uh, something. <laughs> right. we will read all the Hemingway shit. All right. Thanks, guys. If you enjoyed this episode, consider joining our Patreon. Your support helps us keep the show running. Find out more at patreon.com slash why is this good podcast. And for industry news, writing tips, and great short fiction, join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Naples Writers Workshop. You can also subscribe to our monthly newsletter at napleswritersworkshop.com.